So a surfactant is also called an ambiphile. So it has, a, it's a molecule that has parts to it that have different properties. So if we're dealing with a molecule we're going to dissolve in water, we have to have one or more hydrophile, something that will easily dissolve in water, and another part of the molecule that is hydrophobic. And typically the hydrophile will be one or more polar groups. And the hydrophobe will be one or more hydrophobic um, chains or plates. So the hydrophobe could be an alkyl chain, it could be uh, one or more benzene rings, anything that won't dissolve very well in water. Now we might not be dissolving our surfactant in water. We might have a solvent that's uh, that's something like hexane or something like that. And so surfactant actually, a more general definition would be a molecule that has one more, one or more lyophile, where lyo is just for the word meaning solvent, connected to one or more uh, lyophobe. So for, inst so for instance, uh, if we had uh, hexane, the lyophile would be the alkyl chain, and the lyophobe would be something that was more polar. We can categorize surfactants by their uh, hydrophile, whether it is uh, a polar but non-ionic group or an ionic group. So we can have ionic surfactants non-ionic surfactants. The first surfactant synthesized by human would be a soap. And a soap is just a long chain carboxylic acid. A soap is just a long chain carboxylic acid, which is cleaved from fat or an oil using a base. People used to synthesize these from by leaching water through wood ashes. And the base would cleave the carboxylic acid from the triacylglyceride, the resulting sodium or potassium salt is a ionic surfactant. A common synthetic surfactant is SDS, or sodium dodecyl sulfate. So we've got 12 carbons. There's the dodecyl, and there's the sulfate. There's the sodium. The first two surfactants I showed you were anionic surfactants. The head group has a negative charge. There's also cationic surfactant. Here's CTAB. So we have a a quaternary ammonium salt, so a positive G-charged head group, and the hydrophobe is a 16-carbon chain or a cetyl chain, so this is cetyl trimethyl ammonium bromide. A very common type of surfactant is made by pairing up an alkyl chain with a short oligomer of poly polyethylene glycol, and because of the hydrogen bonding hydrogen bond accepting lone pairs on these oxygens, this is hydrophilic. So we've got a hydrophile, hydrophobe, and because we could just imagine different lengths of chains on either side, these are typically abbreviated with the CN terminology. So here we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten carbons on our hydrophobe, so it'd be C10, and then the number of peg units on here, one, two, three, four. So it'd be C10E4. It's an abbreviation for that type of surfactant. The Triton and Igapal families of surfactants are, are two commercial classes of surfactants, two families where there's different R groups built onto this benzene ring and different peg chains. So Triton X is the most famous of this used in a lot of biological applications. Another common head group, non-ionic head group that's very common is to use uh, some form of sugar as our polar head group and then just attach that, to sterify that to a uh, alkyl chain.
Now, of course, there's an almost infinite variety of chains we could have in our surfactant. So I'll just list a couple. The most common is just to have a simple hydrocarbon chain. It's also the cheapest. A fluorocarbon chain is used for applications where we need a really low, we want a surfactant that's really going to be able to lower surfactant. A fluorocarbon chain is used if we need a surfactant that can really lower sur surface tension to a super low number. A silicone chain can also lead to a, a very low surface tension when used as the hydrophobe in a surfactant. These are both more expensive than hydrocarbons, and so they're only used for those specialty applications. Now every surfactant has one or more polar portion and one or more nonpolar portion. And for simplicity, we'll just do one of each to make, keep things simple here. Now imagine we take our surfactant and dissolve it in water. So we have some water. We put in our surfactant molecule. And right away, we can see there's a problem. Because while the energy of the head group is going to be low, because it's dissolved in water and it's polar, we can see the situation of dissolving a nonpolar chain in water is going to be high energy. We can't escape this problem by putting our molecule into oil. If we try to dissolve the molecule in oil, we can see we're going to have, in this case, tail is going to be low energy. We're dissolving something nonpolar in oil. That's easy. On the other hand, if we look at the head group, we can see it's going to be high energy because we're trying to take something polar and dissolve it in oil. So surfactants can deal with this problem of having two different natures in two different ways. Let's look at both of them. The first way surfactants can deal with their sort of split nature is by adsorption, that is, sticking to a surface. So we'll give several examples of this. You can imagine taking our surfactant. We've got some water. And if the surfactant goes up to this interface, the tails, which are nonpolar, are out of the water, and the head groups, which are polar, are in the water. Now we have a beaker made of something nonpolar like polyethylene. We could take our surfactants and have them stick to the bottom. So the nonpolar polyethylene is where these uh, surfactant molecules are sticking to, and their polar head groups are sticking out onto the water. So both of those are adsorption, first to a liquid, in, liquid surface and the second to a solid surface. We could also stick to an interface. So imagine that we had oil and water. Our surfactants, by gathering at this interface, could put their nonpolar chains into the oil and their polar head groups into the water. So all of these are instances of adsorption. This lowers the energy of the system. I should point out that in all three of these cases, in addition to getting the nonpolar tails out of the water, which lowers the energy of the system, we're also decreasing the surface energy. If we look at each of these interfaces, there's an abrupt change from polar to nonpolar, polar to nonpolar, polar to nonpolar. And of course, that means there's going to be a substantial surface energy there. By putting these molecules there and replacing the interface with one that's internal to the molecules, we end up uh, basically replacing oil water contacts with water surfactant contacts and surfactant oil contacts. And so we decrease the surface energy of all three interfaces by putting uh, surfactant molecules there. When we put surfactant molecules into water, they can get their chains out of the water by another mode, aggregation. So if we take our surfactant molecules and allow them to clump together, we can see eventually we can form a nonpolar environment in which the chains of the surfactants are interacting with each other but not with the water, and the head groups are interacting with the water. 
we could do the same thing in oil, where we could form something where the head groups were aggregating and the nonpolar tails were protruding into the oil. You were familiar with this type of aggregate from your earlier studies. You know it as a micelle. What we'll find out is that we can form all sorts of different morphologies of aggregates that depend on the shape of the surfactant and upon the properties of the solvent that we're putting the surfactant in. And indeed, these aggregates can, uh, when they become very concentrated, can form a type of liquid crystal called a lyotropic liquid crystal, which will be the subject of another screencast.